Welcome and thank you for joining us. The early assessment of PK properties using Admit Predictor HTPK Simulation Technology webinar will start shortly. Welcome. We're allowing everyone a, a few more seconds to get connected. But while we do that, I wanted to say we're excited to kick off a follow up to last year's webinar introducing the Admit Predictor HTPK simulation module and how it can be used to effectively provide early PK assessment in discovery programs. Today, we'll talk about workflows and strategies. And the speakers joining me are Andres Oliveras Morales from the Roche Innovation Center, all the way from Basel, Switzerland, and Eric Jamois, Director for Key Accounts and Strategic Alliances for Simulations Plus. Before I turn things over to today's presenters, a few housekeeping notes. We take your privacy rights seriously, and by attending this event or participating in the Q&A session, you are allowing us to contact you for follow-up. Immediately following today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please submit your question at any time using the questions panel on your dashboard. And if you need assistance at any time dur during the webinar, please use the hand raise icon and our staff will assist you. Now again, as we all get settled in and we're approaching about 200 wonderful peers joining us today, I'm going to ask a quick get to know you question. Which sector best describes you? We'll give you just a few seconds to answer and then I'm going to turn it right over to Eric Jamwa. Just a few more seconds left. It's wonderful to see all of our colleagues joining. It looks like we're going to have a full house today, so this is fantastic. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. And it's wonderful to see a large part of our commercial and industry family joining us today. So without further ado, allow me to uh, introduce you once again, Eric Jamois. Eric, take it away. All right, thank you, Arlene. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special webinar featuring the deployment of the HTPK technology at Roche. Uh, as you can imagine, the ultimate reward for us is to see our technology deployed and uh, successfully used at client sites. Uh, we've been privileged to work with Roche uh, towards furthering the HTPK technology. And uh, Andres will be sharing with us the details of this effort. Uh, we have hosted uh, prior webinars detailing the technological background of uh, HTPK and notably the me uh, mechanistic uh, modeling foundation. Uh, you can still find uh, these resources for replay on our website. And actually, I think at the end of this webinar, you will also get a link uh, to these replays so you can capture the, the full background behind uh, what what HTPK actually does. Um, we won't be focusing so much on the background here, but much more on the application and deployment of the HTPK technology at Roche. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andres Olivares Morales, principal scientist and project leader in DMPK PD, modeling and simulation and clinical pharmacology at Roche. Andres has extensive experience in PBPK modeling, and he and his team have been uh, working closely with us 
to bring the, um, the technology to the Roche pipeline. Andres, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks for this very nice and kind introduction. And thank to all the people that actually joined the, the webinar today. I hope you can also see my screen. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, what we would like to share today with you is, um, and it's the use of this technology in our pipeline and how we are actually implementing it as part of our workflows um, and in the early discovery space. So I will cover that and also a bit of introduction on why uh, we're motivated to include this um, in our in our day to day work. Um, before actually I move um, on, I, I'd like to say that this is, um, I have the privilege to be here and present on behalf of the team, but uh, this has been a, a large team effort for several colleagues, of several colleagues um, from different functions, from DMPK and modeling and simulation, um, from period informatics um, to enable this technology, and also for colleagues that, that work in small molecule research on medicinal chemistry and computational chemistry. So before I go, I'd like to <clears throat> briefly introduce VPK, although I might, uh, in this audience, I, I probably, I don't need to do that, but as you know, we have PVPK models. Um, they originated um, actually from a theoretical framework for the, in the 1930s uh, by the work of Theorel. Uh, but in the recent years, in the last 20 years, I was, we see more and more use of PVPK, both in, in, in industry and academia. And, PVPK models obviously provide a significant advantage uh, to us uh, because we can separate what is uh, drug specific from um, system specific. And this allows us to play around with uh, a lot of scenarios where we investigate what are the potential effects of uh, compound properties in the pharmacokinetics of a, of a molecule. And recently has been uh, very well established and it, it's gained uh, also uh, regulatory acceptance. And we have commercial software available that allow us obviously to, to, to use this, uh, this technique uh, in, in more mainstream in, in the industry and also in academia or other settings. Um, in our pipeline, actually we use PVPK from um, at different stages in different flavors. Um, we can go from very lead, early lead identification to help us design uh, experiments or to rank compounds or to understand how the ADME and FISCAM properties integrate to each other. And as I mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, also the scenario assessment, which is really important to know where do we need to optimize and what do we need to find in the early space. But as we transition towards the clinical candidate selection and to the, the, phase, the clinical phases, PPK takes a more prominent role into defining the entry into human doses and to pre the projections for, um, for our new molecules. Also can help us to define um, um, talk studies or also to design talk studies using animal models. But also later in late development or early late development, we, we have a strong focus on the prediction of drug drug interactions or special populations or biopharmaceutics, which is um, it's a it's a growing area um, in the in the PVPK field. We have this uh, also post marketing and virtual bioequivalence and and as you, and you know there are different many applications and. And PVPK now inform drugs labels. So here are three examples from us of so Cotelic, Alessensa, and Rosiltrek. The three compounds, uh, the three the three molecules that have um, they have information uh, that is based on PVPK modeling in our label. And this is um, a relatively new uh, pa paper where uh, this is from the FDA in terms of the uses of PVPK. Uh, in regulatory um, submissions, and we see again uh, there is an increase in, um, in number of uh, applications with PVPK analysis over time. So uh, very growing exponentially, almost from the in the last um, three years. And probably there is a, a, more, a more updated figure for this. But as you see, the main applicability is in the drug drug interaction field and followed by absorption and also special populations uh, such as pediatrics. 
PVPK is something that is not new for us here at Roche and Neil Parrott and other colleagues, Thierry Lave and Hannah Jones, <clears throat> very early on saw the potential of PVPK uh, for the drug discovery space. And they, they envision a strategy which we use fairly um, regularly in, in, our, um, in our pipeline, which is basically verify our PVPK model in preclinical species, understand our in vitro assays, and once we gain confidence, then use that knowledge and translate it um, for our human dose predictions. And this is, uh, as, as I mentioned, where mostly our PVPK work um, is. So in the translational space and the early clinical development from phase zero to phase one. And this strategy has paid off and uh, PVPK is systematically applied since 2003. In, in all our small molecule projects. And, and this is a figure from uh, Neil and, and other colleagues uh, where they checked on the predictiv predictivity of PPK on, and on entering to humans. And in general, for um, around 33 projects, we have um, a twofold uh, error in the prediction. And so 70% of our predictions are within twofold and an average error of twofold, which is uh, fairly good. Um, and is consistent with this strategy. But now if we look at the, at the pipeline and you know the different stages of, um, of drug development and discovery, we see that PVPK, at least for us, and I don't know how it's for the companies, is fairly limited to, to this stage. So the transition from non-clinical to clinical and the uses in, in the early space are fairly limited. And the reasons are uh, manifold uh, why we're not using it in the early space, but most of them is, has to do with obviously availability of different software. And the fact that in the early space, there are several uh, thousands or hundreds of compounds and therefore um, prioritization of a, of a dedicated strategy for modeling single compound or, or a few of them, it's a bit tricky in the early space and therefore this the the in the early space from the lead optimization and lead identification there is pvpk plays a role but it's a minor role compared to other approaches which are uh, mechanistically based uh, but are simple to implement such as uh, equations such as the LEDOS to man or efficacy index or lip and lip and lip lipophilic efficiency and we wonder why we 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 don't have we don't use PVPK in the early space, and we identify a few barriers, um, uh, and one of them has to do with, as I mentioned, the number of compounds and the limited time that uh, the project leaders or the modeling and simulation colleagues or the MedChem teams they have in order to perform these simulations, and also um, uh, the need for many different data sources and and software. So we have different commercial platforms and in-house softwares and lengthy and complex uh, data transfer processes from um, uh, data from in vivo studies or data from in vitro or from uh, compound properties. Um, so that, that's very, very um, those limitations results that actually we don't use it that much. And also, we don't have to, the use of people that are not non-experts in the in the, the field. So most of the the PVPK um, uh, simulations are conducted by specialists, uh, people that really have the knowledge and the training uh, to understand um, uh, the models. And therefore, we 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 embark it uh, in a project with um, with the colleagues that I mentioned at the beginning to bring PVPK early on. And, and for that, we're using the technology that uh, Eric mentioned that is available in uh, uh, Atmic Predictor. So we have a project internally where uh, we want to implement faster, simple, and easier PVPK uh, simulations in the small molecule teams and bring this to the early teams as, as, as soon as possible. And we hope that this will help us change the way in, in, uh, in the way we we, we perform drug discovery <clears throat> by bringing this expertise early in our project teams and even early to the design stage. And one of the, one of the ideas that we had is try to remove this um, burden of manual data transfers. 
and also re try to remove the, the this um, reliance on simplistic equations that sometimes they don't incorporate all the admin processes. For instance, uh, um, absorption uh, is, is generally overlooked um, because the, the equations are focused, focused on potency and clearance. So we wanted to, to overcome that by bringing PVPK. And at the same time, we wanted to reduce animal experimentation. So this, this is one of our goals um, uh, to also as part of this uh, approach is to reduce animal experimentation and to have a more meaningful uh, drug design cycle by using uh, human relevant simulation. But also, which is actually a trend nowadays in the industry, to make use of more um, of sparse data, i.e. Uh, machine learning. So make use of more machine learning uh, pro predicted properties and try to, uh, to figure out which properties are well predicted and which are not, and, and therefore focus on those. And as I mentioned before, uh, the only way to implement this uh, and to and to achieve these goals and uh, it's uh, is by collaborating and we created this collaboration between these three different elements internally and also we work with closely with our colleagues at simulations plus um, for their guidance on the on how to implement this technology and also for the scientific assessment of certain parameters that came uh, from the HTPK uh, module. And for that, that, that's the overall view of the project. And I just wanted to show you a case study of our, one of our internal um, uh, case studies uh, and a very simple and early proof of concept. So we have a small molecule program, and this is the way we expect, uh, obviously, to, to, to look this in, in the future and actually the, the, what we're working towards. Is that we're trying to, we have a small molecule program where we, we know what um, what is the dose target that we want to achieve? So we want to achieve uh, at, at least a predicted human dose that is less than 200 mg and a half-life uh, for this compound um, in a range of 12 to 48 hours. Now, with the equations that I mentioned before, such as the early dose demand, we can easily achieve this by combining our microsomal stability or hepatocyte data with our potency data and get an, an idea of what is the actual projected early human dose, and that can help guide the teams to, to rank compounds. But for the half-life, it's a bit more complicated, and normally um, there are equations for these, Qs are based, but we prefer to use the PVPK approach. And we use these high-throughput PVPK simulations to, to have uh, insights in, in terms of design, and to prioritize our, our compounds uh, and, and to, to help us find the right candidate, basically, and, or candidates that could meet this criteria. And this is an example of how um, this could look like, and actually it's looking for, for a few projects like this, where we have uh, visualizations that are already made that are the output of these high throughput PPK simulations where we can gain insights in terms of what we're we looking for. So here on the right hand side, you can see projected human doses for different uh, candidates. And also on the, in the, on the, on the y-axis, you see the, the, the projections of the half-life. And easily we can we can find that actually if we only focus on on those uh, we might miss the compounds that actually um, are the right ones for meeting our criteria. While we have compounds with shorter half lives that as uh, that we want, uh, or even longer half lives, while they have the same dose. So this level of insights were not were not available before uh, we implemented the PVPK approach. And what is nicer is that also we can get a simulated uh, PK profile, so we can get an understanding. So all these compounds, they have the same level of target engagement, this, though, although they have different pharmacokinetics. Um, so this has to do with the potency and the compound properties. So we can get more insights, we can get ideas of the CMAX and the AUC or the CTROF and, and, and look further into other properties such as toxicity and so on. So all this can be achieved with this uh, approach, which uh, actually we find it really informative. And what's more, we can look into, from a design space, we can look into um, properties and see whether which properties are relevant for the compounds. Uh, in this case, we're focusing on half-life, and we can see here that um, if we have the right combination of clearance and lipophilicity, we end up in a, in a right space in terms of half-life. Um, depicted here by these green colors. 
and these are kind of insights that uh, the team are really appreciated and can help the medicinal chemistry team to to design uh, better molecules now we can also look at the impact of other properties into in, into bas basic fundamental pharmacokinetic properties for instance solubility and permeability which normally you you think you need to optimize for those but given the space of, and the pkpd properties of these compounds the impact, for instance, in the absorption uh, of these properties is relatively limited, given that the doses that we're using are relatively low. So in, in, in this space, we, we're not focusing that much for this, um, for this example, but obviously for other, for other examples or other projects could be different. And this can provide the team guidance of where we need to focus and, and what is actually relevant for the, for the projects and what's not. And, all of this is, is generated and, and all these insights that come from uh, these systematic PVPK assessments. But these are obviously prospective simulations. We also want to look into retrospective simulations and see actually whether we can rely on this. And we, we, we had the luxury of having some in vivo data available for, for some of these compounds and we can look into the IV predictions uh, for this project, for instance in terms of volume of distribution, clearance, and half-life. And we can see that most of the predictions are within twofold, which give us a, a good confidence that we can extrapolate uh, our in vitro assays. But also for the oral pharmacokinetics, we see that actually th there is a really nice correlation between observed and predicted, although there is an overestimation of certain parameters. But for ranking purposes, this is ideal because we want to prioritize the, the best possible compounds so we can rely on, on this ranking uh, for, for, this, um, for this series and, and these compounds. And that's the whole idea of being able to implement PVPK early on in the stage, uh, in the discovery stage, is that we can, we can focus more on predictivity and also move faster with predictive models. So we gain these insights and we have, we have optimized, uh, we actually, we, we are prioritizing compounds based on these uh, insights. And, and obviously one, one key take home message from this as well is that we have to have good, uh, good and predictive assays um, uh, for each project. So in this case, we knew that our in vitro assays were predictive because we checked the IVIVE before so hepatocytes for instance uh, so we we gain confidence in moving forward but you might ask well is this actually an, an one-off and what if, what if um, how are the other compounds or other projects or new projects will be predicted and this is um very fresh um this is a work from our phd student doha naga and neil and myself where we actually looked into certain compounds that for which we had in vivo data and we had every single in vitro parameter um, that actually was necessary to predict um, the pharmacokinetics after all administration. And so we, we look into 200 structurally different uh, differentiated compounds of Roche, and you can see here the different properties, the distribution of log D, of molecular weight, permeability, uh, fraction and bound, solubility, and clearance. And we looked into, into this by asking us several questions. So first, can we predict the IV clearance of these compounds? Again, by just taking the in vitro data and, and moving forward. Secondly, can we uh, use this? How is the predictions in terms of uh, when using machine learning models? So for this, we're using the, the ADMET predictor um, software uh, to use uh, to, to guide us in terms of intrinsic clearance and, and properties that are needed for the prediction of clearance. And um, how does this work in, in terms of oral predictions? So if you know the clearance, so how is the absorption model and, and how reliable are these predictions? So these are the, the questions that we ask to this uh, data set. And here you can see the results. Um, in here from, uh, I have six panels here. I hope you can see that. Um, so there are different ways of scaling clearance. So here, this clearance is scaled by using hepatocytes, and this is rat data. Uh, we use uh, direct scaling dilution method, or we assume that the, everything is unbound, um, or we use a machine learning model or the OSIN method uh, in admin predictor. 
And here you can see that our predictions of clearance are within threefold for 63 to 76% of the simulations. Um, for high clearance compounds, direct scaling works better. For low clearance compounds, the dilution method seems to be better. The machine learning model actually doesn't do um, that bad, although the correlation is not as great as when we have in vitro data. Um, and if you assume that everything that you have is unbound, uh, then you have this uh, under prediction, which is uh, reported in the literature. Here uh, on the left hand side, uh, on the bottom left, it's an ex it's, this is for reference only, and this is uh, a back calculated intrinsic clearance that was fed into the admit and gastroplasm in this case, actually, to be precise, and to simulate just to check that the software does what it's supposed to be doing, and which was the case. So what, what was surprising for us is actually that the machine learning predictions for this set that is actually um, completely new for Admin Predictor <laughs> in the sense of the, the actually hasn't seen our structures, is that the success rate was between 36% to 60% within two to threefold, which is not obviously the best, but it's actually interesting in the sense that it allows us to, to get some idea of the ranking. Now, if we look into the oral predictions, like similar plots, uh, but uh, but from the oral space, then of course the prediction su success is it's a bit reduced from in vitro data only. So between uh, 40 to 60 percent of our predictions were within um, twofold for using the direct scaling and the dilution method a, a, li a little bit less. The, the, uh, the, the bias was around threefold or fourfold with the dilution method. But the, the correlation, actually, in terms of ranking, uh, and, and remember, these are naive predictions, so actually there are no refinements or not learn and confirm cycles here. Um, it's, it's, it's good for what we want in the early space. So we are, we're basically, we're able to rank our compounds. So this suggests that this strategy, actually, to shifting into a more predictive uh, approach in the early space is actually valuable. Now, what we looked into, in addition to that, is actually is we wanted to understand what is the source of error uh, in this prediction. So here on the bottom, what you see are predictions that are made while, while knowing the clearance. So basically, we use that intrinsic clearance value that was determined from in vivo as a plugin. And then we use all the in vitro properties to predict the oral predictions. And, and this is the AUC in, in the case of, of this RAT AUC. And we see that actually the predictions improve massively within twofold. So which tell us what, that we really need to understand our clearance model and our clearance predictions. And um, why it seems that the absorption model predictions are relatively good, especially for these early stages that we're looking um, at ranking. And here on the bottom, you see our predictions uh, using the, the machine learning models. So what we learn here um, and what we want to, to say is that although you might not have the best prediction, the, the directionality and the ranking is on the right direction when you use in vitro data. And machine learning actually gives you an idea of where we should. Uh, and it's also give you uh, relatively decent predictions. So you can be a scenario where you can work with sparse data and still get a meaningful information out of the PBBK model. So therefore, we, we were happy with this. And uh, I mentioned, I, I think I should have mentioned that all these simulations were done in Gastroplus, uh, the, the, the previous ones. And then we wanted to compare whether the, the, the Gastroplus and actually the, the simulation te technology that is in, uh, in Admin Predictor and the HT PBBK, uh, can also maintain that performance. Uh, actually, we did an assessment. And for those who don't remember, so a traditional PPK model is a larger distribution uh, PPK model, plus uh, the absorption uh, model that is fairly complex. Uh, the high throughput uh, model is a simplified distribution model and the complex absorption model. But for what we want, again, uh, it's it's good for what we the purpose that we're looking into the early space. And we looked into this with uh, actually with Eric and other colleagues from Simulations Plus, and and actually we're pretty impressed of of the consistency, at least using our data and internal data, 
between the two software. So we compare admin predictor and gastroplast when using in vitro inputs. So here's for CMAX and AUC in, in this RAT data set. And then we just we also repeat the same exercise by using the machine learning uh, input parameters that come from admin predictor or, uh, and gastroplast. And we got a really good consistency. And why I'm showing this, because it's important to mention that the difference in speed <laughs> of the simulations is uh, dramatically. So with HTPVPK, we can, we can simulate thousands of compounds or hundreds of compounds in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in minutes or, or seconds, whereas in, in Gastroplus or other platforms, it takes a bit longer than that for one compound, basically. So for the discovery space, that's what we need. We need speed. And we need, obviously, reliability as well. So that's why we're, we're focusing on bringing this technology to to our, to our pipeline. And what can we get out of, uh, of a high throughput PPK simulations? Well, we can simulate a rat and a human PK. We can simulate um, um, an oral dose on, uh, or an IV volus, um, which is something that uh, it was added recently to the, the software, which is something that really happy uh, to see. But we get all the, the standard PPK, PK parameters. So you see CMAX, half-life, fraction absorbed, fraction by available, which is really what we need, and volume of distribution, which I also mentioned uh, is, is here calculated using uh, mechanistic equations, which is something that the, the design teams really want to know. But in addition, there is actually a feature that it, it gives us um, a guidance of what could be the potential early doses, which can guide because, and take all these properties, potency, clearance, solubility, etc., and and combine this uh, with, by, by defining a concentration, which I want to achieve. And this can be done by compound, or it can be done by, you know, by the whole series, depends on, on the data we have available. And we can look for a C-mean concentration, or C-max, or C-average, which gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, guiding uh, our teams. And using all this, um, we're very, we were very happy, and that's why we, we contacted the colleagues from Simulations Plus, and we enter into these discussions of how we can implement this in our platform. So going back to my initial slide, so <clears throat> that where, where I mentioned about the, the strategy that we have, this learn and confirm cycle, which is something that it has proven to be successful, and therefore we're not going to change it for uh, the entering to, into the, the, the clinics. But in the early space, we didn't have much of the PPK. So now, um, Taking a bit of the analogy that Simulations Plus does with, with their software, we, are, we want to focus on speed, ranking, and prioritization at the early stages. And therefore, we will bring this technology, or actually we, the technology is already there, in our early space. And try to reduce these learn and confirm cycles as much as possible, but try to make sure that we develop, we design the best compounds early. And then when we go into, into the clinical candidate selection, we will transition in between these two approaches into a more dedicated and tailor-made um, uh, PVPK approach. Here, for instance, in Basel, our, our, our police, they have a really nice Tesla car, so we can really customize our software and customize our modeling approaches when we move uh, in the late, late, late stages. But in the early space, we don't really need that level of customization. We want to make sure that we we bring the insights and we help the design of better compounds. So how do we implement this? And one of the things that I mentioned was this data transfer and data, data transfer processes. So the way we, we actually work on this is actually we, we look into our databases and we created an app. This app actually brings all the information necessary to run the simulations, retrieve the company information, Seamlessly, seamless, seamless, uh, in, a, in a seamless manner, translate sends this data into into the software. In this case, Admet Predictor, and sends the results back directly to you, to the project teams via a web portal, for instance. Um, for this, we use Spotfire uh, to 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 send the visualizations, and we have created all the IT infrastructure to do that. In addition, we have access to our PK databases, so we can actually validate models, as, a, as you saw for the previous for the example that I gave. And for the early, early um, compounds that have not been synthesized, we use this in, in, in by just using the machine learning models and, and combined with a service. So 
this makes the integration of this uh, PVPK and the complicated steps that, that to develop a PVPK model, uh, they, they're basically gone from the user, the end user. And now we have this in, or we will have this for, for most of our projects very soon by, uh, by, by in a few weeks and months. So here's how it looks like. So we have an app uh, that uh, just, uh, the, as I mentioned, where we can retrieve the data and actually generate the input data and send it to the software. And the, the user just log into a landing page, selects the, the project that they want to see, and then they click a few times and they get the data and this and up and then simulations uh, later. So you see then we can transfer this to our to our um, from our servers to Atom Predictor. And then in the end we get this kind of visualization similar to the one I showed you before, where we get um, the compound space, the individual PK simulations, all these things are done in a seamless manner, uh, fully automated, with just a few clicks from the users. So that means that all these different data source connections are actually now um, uh, done automatically for all the users. And this is the way uh, we are implementing this uh, uh, in this project. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Um, so we are able to implement these uh, high throughput PPK simulations in our small molecule project teams using our in-house data as inputs or machine learning models or any other um, models. Um, it's a seamless process. Uh, we have uh, created internal workflows that allows to, to do that. And the users, the end users, they actually, they, they, they can set up this very easily with minimal intervention, which brings us to the point that um, the data consumers, basically, which could be the project teams or medicinal chemists, uh, DMPK colleagues or modeling and simulation colleagues, they can, they can even run this themselves. So we don't really need, uh, uh, you know, knowing actually the software in too much details because this is very narrowed to this specific task. So running simulations and creating ranking uh, based on PVPK insights. Uh, and also looking into other space, like in the design space and looking into the early properties uh, with these visualizations. And obviously the most uh, important thing is that it's all in integrated with our um, workflows in terms of PK so that we can validate the models uh, retrospectively and not just for a single compound, but for a whole series of compounds, which is the most attractive um, approach. And that's why we're, we're very excited about this and very excited that we, uh, we were finally there and that uh, by working with our colleagues, uh, again, in Simulations Plus, we are where we were supposed to be. Uh, and looking forward to to make sure that this is uh, continued in, into our project pipeline. So with that, I, again, I want to acknowledge all the team members that have been uh, really uh, collaborating from a scientific point, from a technical point, uh, making sure that we can uh, we we are at this stage of our project and uh, where we can share something with you. And we look forward for uh, for the implementation. And I'm happy now to take questions. Um, but, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Andres. Great presentation. Two quick questions before we launch the Q and A session. One: Are you currently using the HTPK module within Admit Predictor? We'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and answer. If you haven't done so already, again, you may send your written questions using the questions pane on your control panel. And the last question, does your organization plan to deploy a discovery PDPK program within the next three to six months? Again, we'll give you just a few seconds here. The questions are coming in, so I'm going to be bringing Eric back into the conversation. And Eric, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, first, I would like to thank Andres again for a really nice presentation. Um, you know, thank you so much. It's really interesting, very interesting stuff. 
Um, there, there are a few questions that uh, have come over the wire, and um, and one that uh, I think is probably actually on a lot of uh, different minds, uh, and it has to do with um, the use. I mean, when you are predicting, uh, when you're doing those predictions. Um, and so you're using clearance and um, volume of distribution information in order to, uh, you know, to, to input, I mean, to provide clearance and volume of distribution information, or you're using Roche proprietary models, or are you, are you using the uh, models that are pre-built in the, in the software? Uh, and I think it's a really good question because, I mean, actually the, the software allows you to do both. So um, I think you answered this maybe partially on slide 23, but but it's it's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I can activate my video as well. Then sure. that yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so we use both um, uh, for when we have the in vitro data. Uh, we we use the in vitro data to extrapolate and to um, Provided that we have a good in vitro to in vivo extrapolation, so we check on this. This is a, this is always a must in our project. So we check on the microsomes, we check on the hepatocytes, we, we try to understand their in vitro systems. Um, but when it comes to volume of distribution, we we generally rely again on mechanistic equations. So um, uh, PPPK modeling, uh, I mentioned this uh, Rogers Lukakova equation. Um, and this is the this is I would say is our preferred approach. So we focus a lot on our mechanistic understanding. Now, when it comes when we don't have the the data, uh, if we have a machine learning model that can predict those in vitro properties, we might use that one. If we don't have that one, we will use the one that is built in Atme Predictor. And I think I mentioned in in our discussions, for instance, PKAs is one of those things that we we generally go with the atom predictor uh, because obviously it's predictive and again it depends also on the sensitivity right we, we need to check uh, for pvpk models it's really important to understand what what parameters are sensitive and sometimes the dose might not be sensitive to certain input parameters and for those we can have limited data i hope that answered the question yes yes thank you and th there was actually a related question on um, how does the automated system decide when to use the in vitro data versus the in silico data, you know, in the HDPK simulation? Um, so that's and, a great question. And um, normally it's the users and the, the project teams. So the, the project teams define the rules. They can define what is the, the, the primary, what is the secondary and tertiary and so on and so forth. So the the automated system, what it does is it doesn't run the simulations for you. There will be an user that will click next, next, next in the in an app, but they will be prompted to make decisions. If the user doesn't want to make any decisions, so there, there is a naive project, something that just started and there is not much knowledge, then we will use the default approach. We will be always in vitro, followed by in silico. So that that's kind of the rules. But if the users they know that they might have an in silico model that would be better uh, than the in vitro for whatever reason, then they could focus on that. And again, it's customizable. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. Um, I'm reading another one here. Have you explored how the predictions work for different classes of compounds or different ECCS classifications? Yes, uh, actually, the work that Doha did, we. I didn't actually. If you, if I go back to those slides, we actually looked into into the ECCS, and I, I have. <laughs> I apologize, but the labels here are different ECCS classes. So obviously, metabolism-driven uh, clearance. Uh, it's the majority of the compounds in this data set, as you can see here, uh, from here, from the class two. So and. But we do have compounds that are predicted, at, at least, to be uh, renally eliminated or by other mechanisms. Uh, unfortunately, the number is fairly limited to really make a conclusion on those. But the ones that are, uh, we we focus, we also look into into this as well. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question. Uh, how do you integrate the machine learning models with, with the PBPK model? Um, and well, that that's kind of part of the admit predictor environment, but I will let you answer the question. <laughs> Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, thanks for answering partially. So we do, again, if we do have all the in vitro data, all the input parameters, we will use that as a primary. But if we don't have, for instance, the fraction unbound in plasma, then uh, if we have a good machine learning model for that, then we can simulate um, our compounds or our doses of predictions using, again, a combination of both in vitro to in silico data. And in the early stages where there is nothing, then of course we will rely on the machine learning models. But again, this is fairly early and we haven't really uh, really gone into that process given that actually the technology, the HTPK technology is fairly early, right? So the, the latest release we got was last year uh, and the version of the software we have today. And I think we are finalizing this. So we don't have that much experience in, in the early space, like in the really design space, but we're trying to get there so to understand what is the best approach um, for that. But for the compounds that already exist, then a combination of, again, in silico, in vitro, is the way to go, at least in, in our minds, uh, when there is no in vitro data or there is sparse data. Okay, well, thank you again. And uh, do, Arlene, are we, uh, are we still pretty good for a couple more questions? Yes, we are doing very well. So uh, lots of good good comments and good questions in the in the panel there for you to choose from, Eric. Um, so another one relates to how to find the impact of uh, variations of the, I mean, how the FISCAM parameters are going to impact the HTPK simulation. Um, you know, I mean, I know that for some of them, um, you know, like PATH, you can you can see if you know compounds are, um, you know, um, permeability limited or solubility limited. But I, I maybe you have further insight about other FISCAM parameters, you know, influence on on you know the whole HTPK simulation. That's actually an an excellent question, and again, it's something that we need to look. Uh, on a project specific level, uh, it will depend. So if you have a com if you have a project where you know all your compounds are extremely potent, let's say, uh, and low clearance, and your well, and your doses predicted are relatively small, then permeability and solubility will have very little impact on the dose. It, they have obviously an impact on the pharmacokinetics, but on the dose, uh, it will, will not be limited by that. And you can do these assessments by project. Uh, so that's the only way to, to assess what is relevant, right? So you need to check on, on the overall, on the combined approach. Now there is a, a secondary, maybe, maybe that is related to that question, and it has to do with the uncertainty on the measurements or the uncertainty on the machine learning predictive properties. And this is an area of actually extensive research um, in the in the recent maybe two to three years, and the approach for that, uh, in, in in my opinion, is uh, sensitivity assessments. So sensitivity analysis. At the moment, I think Admet Predictor includes some sensitivity analysis, yeah. um, maybe for two properties, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think an expansion on that it could be interesting to check on other properties. And I think that's the key because all the base models, right? Uh, system of differential equations like PVPK models, uh, they have no linear. So the propagation of error is not linear, right? And therefore some properties might have an impact and, and some other properties might not. And are actually, um, we have a PhD student still Yao that actually looked into this from a disposition point of view. And she published recently a paper when you see depending on the parameter space you are, you might not have an impact at all on the volume of distribution because you're like in a completely unsensitive space. 
and and I, I think my recommendation would be that in, in terms of PVPK, uh, you need to do sensitivity analysis. It's, mm -hmm. it's not another way. <laughs> there is no other way. Yeah, because uh, you could you could try to see something wrong with a compound where you know whereas that property has literally no effect whatsoever. So exactly. uh, and you can also find situation where if that's a real problem, you know the compound probably cannot be saved just because it has no influence on it. Um, so I mean, in terms of rescue, I don't know if it has. Do you think it has any implications in terms of sort of compound rescue potential? That that you know if if it makes, I mean, if it doesn't affect that property, then, you know, potentially it wouldn't be able to be rescued, right? Yeah. And one of the things that, um, actually, one of the limitations for global sensitivity analysis or even local sensitivity analysis is sometimes the speed of the simulations, right? Uh, that's one of the, the, the limitations. But having a software or, or a script or anything that can run thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of simulations in a, in, in a relatively short amount of time will allow us to actually to check on, on different uncertainty scenarios for properties. So for instance, you can take a distribution of fraction of money plasma and then simulate all of them and see whether they have or not an impact in, 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 in a certain endpoint. And that's something that we can do with softwares like this. Of course, you need to find a workaround, but it's something that it can be done. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I actually, you know, speed actually changes the way we think about scientific problems to in, in many, many respects that if something, you know, is going to take, you know, half a day or a few days to to actually do, you're going to kind of think twice about investing that time to, to actually do it. But if it takes just a few minutes, you're just going to run it and see what the results are. So really, you know, that couple orders of magnitude in terms of speed, you know, actually does change, I think, quite a bit how we react to it as scientists. And if it if it's fast enough, we just, you know, we have this nature to, you know, just try it. Um, so no, I think that's, a, that's, that's really pretty critical. Um, and maybe one last one, can HTPBPK rank order predict BBB permeability or maybe incorporate that in the design uh, in early discovery compounds. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's uh, the answer. Yeah, we, yeah, we have uh, we have a, a blood brain barrier model within the the software. So if you wanted to incorporate that as one of your parameters, you you definitely could. I, I don't I th I don't think it's one of the parameters that play in the HTPK simulation. But if it was a sort of a filtering criteria um you could definitely do that yeah um, because uh, yeah at the moment this the distribution is just a central compartment basically we don't yeah. have there are no organs uh, at the moment so okay thanks for that because i wasn't aware of the, the bpb model yep all right well i think uh you know we're, we're going to gather all the questions we're not able to answer them all but we i think you know definitely thankful to you for answering a large number of them so and also very thankful about uh you know some really great content that uh, you were able to share with us uh and uh if uh if everything is good i think we're you know gearing up to close the session Ar arlene is there anything else you'd like to uh to say before we close yes thank you again andres and eric we appreciate you sharing with us your approaches for deployment of the HTPK module and we invite our audience to learn more about the scientific accuracy and simplicity the HTPK model, our module provides for early drug design and optimization. Please visit our website at www.simulations-plus.com. The webinar has been recorded for playback and will be available on our website and YouTube channel. And again, as Eric said, we will get back to anyone who had a question uh, in a follow-up email. Again, thank you. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Thank you. So, thank you so much again, Andres. Have a great rest of the day. Thank and you. Thanks bye. everyone for joining. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>